welcome again to another Bible study. Always a joy to see you. Thank you for taking the time. The world is busy. Time is short. But I do pray that what we are studying and what you are learning will be something that will really equip you. It will be fantastic information and give you the ability to understand for yourself and also to help others because that's really what we're all here about. And that, that's why we're here on planet Earth. If you think about it, the moment you're saved, you get a job description from the Lord, and that means to tell others about the Lord, that he loves them, that he died to pay for their sin, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, and that whosoever call on his name and believe on him will be saved. That's a guarantee that he gives us. So we're on lesson number 10 in our spiritual gifts, and we're wanting to wrap up the series soon. So join me as we go over to our notes. So we'd spoken about Acts 2, 10 and 19 and, and how we would work out understanding these uh, particular passages by putting them on a timeline and obviously asking the questions who was speaking, when, where, how, why, what was going on. And uh, it, it, that helped us to, to discern where these things fit. Um, I take a quote from Sir Robert Anderson. He says, the book of Acts is primarily the record, not of the founding of the Christian church, but of the apostasy of the favored nation, Israel. Okay, remember that. It's an important piece of information. Now what I want to do is go through a timeline of the transition from the kingdom offer to the grace program. So we'll look at the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. And I want you to notice that many changes took place over a short period of time. And during this time, people were caught in that transition, some knowing just the first part of the information, some knowing a little bit more, some only coming in later. And so um, let's have a look at chart and, and understand how the progress of revelation was taking place, particularly during this uh, transitional period of time. So if we look at the first section of the chart, you'll see we're dealing with John the Baptist. That's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John begins preparing Israel and saying that the kingdom is at hand. He is baptizing, water baptizing. He identifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Only later in his ministry, when God shows the sign of the dove and the voice from heaven to identify this is the Lamb of God. You read about that in Luke 3 verse 22. The next thing we understand is that the Lord Jesus is now entering into his ministry for a period of three years, and the kingdom is nigh. It's in the midst. It's in the midst of Israel, and it's divided. Israel is now being divided into the what we would call the remnant, being the little flock, and unbelievers, people who were rejecting what was happening, uh, which later becomes part of apostate Israel. The next thing after those three years, we then find that the Lord dies on the cross, he sends into heaven, and then the Holy Ghost becomes operative. Um, the kingdom is now offered again to Israel. This is, we read about that in Acts 1 to 7. It, there's about a one-year period involved there. So the kingdom is offered again to Israel. It's the last days and the signs of the Holy Ghost are given, giving power to witness to the believers, and they are meeting daily in the temple. Israel reject this message as a nation they kill Stephen and they begin the fall and the diminishing then we read about Israel being scattered this is over a period of about 17 years Acts 8 to 15 and also uh, later on we would pick it up in what we call the Hebrew epistles now the kingdom has been postponed Israel is scattered due to her, the persecution that is going on the believers are scattered they leave it, Jerusalem and they go preaching to Jews only uh, the 12 apostles remain in Jerusalem because that was what their instruction was. They understood that. And as time goes on, we find that the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. Next thing we find is that Paul comes into the picture. He brings grace salvation. And we read of that from Acts 9 through to 28. Israel is fallen. The mystery program is brought in. The gospel of grace is now preached to Jew and to Gentile. There are signs and wonders to authenticate Paul's ministry, but as soon as that is done, those signs and wonders cease, and those powerful, empowering spiritual gifts cease. And of course, we now have Paul's 13 epistles from Romans through to Philemon, which are written to fulfill the word of God. So if you have a look here, you'll see what was going on in a short space of time. Many, many changes were taking place as this was developing. 
the transition is over and the word of God is complete. And we don't witness those activities of the Holy Spirit, such as the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in tongues, with signs following um, in anyone who comes to believe in the Lord and be saved. The Holy Spirit now seals and indwells the believer, and there is no visual evidence of this happening. It's internal, not an external uh, evidence. Our program is that we walk by faith and not by sight. There is an internal spiritual awakening that the Lord performs the moment a person trusts him exclusively as the only Savior who paid for our sins and rose again from dead. Remember, Paul is the apostle and is the only one who explains what is happening and how God is still reaching to the world but no longer through Israel. Again, this diagram just explains how it was intended that God would reach the world through Israel and go to the Gentiles. But because of their rejection, this program for Israel was postponed. And in spite of this, because of the crosswork, the Lord still brought grace to both Gentiles and now to Jews. Uh, the Bible talks about him having mercy because all are in unbelief, both Jew and Gentile, and he now has mercy on everyone. So God's grace and mercy could be offered to the world and all who trust him because of this cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having looked at many aspects of the, the gift of speaking in tongues, I want you to briefly consider other gifts mentioned in scripture. Remember the list we had in lesson one, and that these were supernatural gifts and empowering necessary at the time, because the word of God was still incomplete, and the Jews required evidence from God that he was saving Gentiles, but those gifts were also given to edify the body of Christ in its infancy. So we're going to look at the, the two references to gifts being 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8 to 10, and then uh, verse 27. So we have the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, workings of miracles, prophecy, verse 27, um, where it, gifts are given as apostles, prophets, teachers, gift of healings, miracles, helps as well are mentioned. And moving on in the list, we, have re we read about the gift of discerning of spirits, uh, kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. And then we learn about governments and diversities of tongues being mentioned under the other group. Now, reading and studying God's word is critical to our ability today to live for and serve the Lord and be effective ambassadors for him. The reading and the studying of God's word is directly related to the amount of study of his word and that word working effectually in us, which we read of in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. Now, it's like an iceberg in the sea. It, with an iceberg, only the tip is seen, and there's a huge amount of ice below the water that stabilizes the iceberg. So we need to fill up and hide God's word in our minds and our hearts in order to be able to share it, to reach and teach others. You see the illustration here is that our output is is only a small portion of our input, the necessity to take in the word of God, to study, meditate, and uh, take it in. So today, as the body of Christ, we have fruits as abilities and characteristics which come from God's word, fruits of the Holy Spirit, and our willingness to allow Christ to work in us and through us. As we look briefly at the other gifts that we've mentioned, the question is asked, is faith a gift? No, it's not. Faith is not a gift given by God to certain people. Faith is the capacity to trust and believe, which is part of our God-given makeup. That's how God designed us. No person can stand before God and say they could not believe because God had not given them the gift of faith. Notice in 1 Corinthians 12 that Paul is writing to believers, so they already had been saved. So they had saving faith. Faith comes from hearing the word of God, and the choice is made to trust and believe what God has declared in his record, the Bible. As Romans 10, 17 tells us, so then faith cometh from hearing, and by hearing the word of God. And then it's interesting in 1 John 5, 10, the scripture says, He that believe on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. 
Then John goes on, he says, these things have I written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that he may know that you have eternal life and that he may believe on the name of the Son of God. So I put this reference in here because it has to do with how God has given us witness in his record. And that is the word of God. So in theology and in Calvinism, etc., there's all kinds of uh, different ideas out there um, that are not Bible based. It's taught that you were dead before you were saved and therefore you had no capacity to believe or to have faith. So God must grant a gift of faith to anyone in order to be saved. And that is in error. That would make God liable for people who would be saved and liable for those who remained lost in unbelief. In the context of the transitional period, again, remember the word was not complete and therefore the confident faith that they had was from the Holy Spirit, the resource that God had provided. It was him who empowered them with wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, etc. for the body of Christ, that infant church, and resulted in them knowing what they were to do. Today, we have faith to be saved, but also our confidence to make a stand for truth grows as we study God's word, and it is the word that works effectually in us, no longer supernatural gifts as in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13, to execute God's will on earth as members of the body of Christ. Remember that the power today is in God's word, not in our faith. I would say there's a difference between saving faith, that's simple trust when you come to know Christ, you hear the gospel, you trust it, you believe on it, you rely on it, and therefore you are saved. And then of course there's serving faith, that's the desire and the will to have Christ live in me and through me, which Paul declared in Galatians 2 chapter verse 20 such beautiful so we don't have time to look up all these references but I leave it to you to to pause the video if you need to or get the notes and look up these verses they're going to help you and in Romans 5 verse 1 it reminds us therefore being justified by faith that saving faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ so there are different aspects and types of faith or the way that the word is used in scripture, such as the empowering faith given to the early church, or the saving faith, which is a choice to believe and results in salvation, and then is followed by serving faith. We read about that in Ephesians 6, verse 6 and 7, where it says, Not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Philippians 2.13 reminds us how this operates, something really beautiful, for he says, it is God which work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Okay, so as we've, we've mentioned, the result of meditating, studying, reading God's word with the right heart, with an open mind and an open heart to the Lord, the result of that would be the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We also know about the faith of Christ, which is the unfailing faithfulness of the Lord himself to do his father's will and to die for our sins to secure our salvation for all who would believe. So it's clear from scripture that it is God's will that all be saved. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, he declares who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Again, looking into what faith is and how it operates, one finds clarity in rightly dividing and putting scripture in the appropriate program on the timeline. So the gift of faith is not operative during the dispensation of grace. Let's have a quick look at the gift of healing. There's so much confusion among Christians regarding the subject of, of healing and how God heals and assists anyone today. Again, the confusion is related to a failure to rightly divide into the programs God has given. It's clear that miraculous physical healing is not part of the dispensation of grace until the rapture takes place, whereby every believer will be healed because we will receive a brand new glorious body. If you look at the records of healing in time past, that is in the Old Testament times and then Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and part of Acts, we see many instances of miraculous healing taking place, including the raising of the dead to life again. So healing 
is part of the signs of God's intervention, the physical restoration of Israel, and therefore part of the physical kingdom promises. Healings took place during the time past period known as the signs to evidence a prophet was of God. He was speaking God's word. He therefore had the ability to heal. Healing was also connected to the signs of the Messiah, uh, which we read about in Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, and um, is explained in Luke 7, 21 to 22. Consider a few scriptures as listed below. It's always good to read directly from the scriptures. So we're going to go through this uh, fairly quickly, uh, but it's important information. I want you to notice these are a few readings, only a few, but they deal with some of the healing we see recorded in the Old Testament. In Galatians 20, 17 to 18, we find that Abraham prays for Abimelech and God heals Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants. In Exodus 4, 6 to 8, we, we understand God is given the sign of healing as evidence of God speaking through him, which sign would be for the Jews throughout their history. That is what God would give them. In Exodus 23, 25, it says, He shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take a, I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. In Exodus 15, 26, we read, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. In Psalm 103, verse 3, we read, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. So remember, this was part of God's instruction and conditions given to Israel that if they would do what he requested, if they would obey, he would bless them. He would remove diseases. That's what he would do. But if they would, re if they go back to idol worship and reject what he was saying and disobey him, then they would receive the curses of such hardship as being scattered and having diseases upon them and, and illness, etc. So it's all linked to that. Anyway, moving on. 1 Kings 17.22, we see that Elijah raises the widow's son from dead and she acknowledges Elijah as a man of God and that God's word and truth is in his mouth. In 2 Kings 20 verse 5, Hezekiah, the king, is healed from a terminal disease by the Lord. He's granted a further 15 years of life on earth. In 2 Kings 4.34, we read of Elisha, the prophet, raising the Shunammite son from dead. 2 Kings 5.14, Elisha heals Naaman of leprosy. Jeremiah 30 verse 17 says, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, said the Lord. Lastly, let's look at references in Isaiah 35 verse 5, where the signs are given to Israel of what will happen when the Messiah comes. It says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And then Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Okay, so the work of the cross is what we would call a horizontal truth, an interdispensational truth, because the healing would come to all who believe in the Lord Jesus. That's healing from the terminal disease of sin that every human being carries. So that's talking about being healed by his stripes of sin, in other words, we get eternal life. But of course, it also refers here directly to Israel first, as she was to carry the message and to be God's nation, kingdom nation, the priesthood nation, to take the glorious message to the rest of the world. As we know, that did not happen. So please join me in the next lesson, because then we're going to look at the healing records that we find in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And also, we're going to have a closer look at what does Paul write about healing in his writings, Romans through to Philemon. I hope that you can see that there were times in the Old Testament where God spoke about healing all their diseases. 
and that they would have none of these diseases. So we're not talking about one or two people here and there. We're talking about the whole nation, which, of course, is connected to the condition of the kingdom on earth. And we're at the end of another study. Um, please remember the notes are available if you want them. Just send me an email. You can then work through those notes and you can pull out the succinct gems that, that you feel are helpful and answer the questions that you have and equip you to reach others. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining and I look forward to seeing you next time. Blessings in the Lord and go read your scriptures. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.